Thank you, Caroline. I'm not used to standing on a stage. Um, so yes, my name is um, Jenny, and I'm Director of Strategy at Precedent, and I'm here to talk to you today um, about customer experience, um, or perhaps in particular about what opportunities digital presents to organisations in improving their customer experience. Um, I'm going to do this by showing you some examples from across a range of different sectors and how they're delivering great customer experience, but also spending a little bit of time thinking about what the implications may be for healthcare. Now, in the last few years, the internet has literally changed everything. It has fundamentally changed the expectations of our customers, and it's physically changed their behaviours, the way in which they interact and communicate with us as organisations. And at a time when 79% of people in the UK will search online for health information, there's never been a better time, really, to start thinking about how you can better use, better harness the power of digital to improve your own customer experiences, be that with patients, service users, health professionals, doctors, and so on. So I'm going to start with a nice, easy question. Why do we exist? <laughs> now, unfortunately, I'm no philosopher or great intellectual, so you're going to have to bear with me while I grossly oversimplify this. But you could say that there are two ways of looking at why in the modern world we exist. Perhaps one reason is to be as successful as we can be, to be the best we can be, achieve our ambitions and leave our mark on the world. Or perhaps that's rubbish, it's just about biology. It's an accident of evolution. We're programmed by our genes to survive and die. But in reality, it's probably a combination of both. If you subscribe to um, something such as Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, um, he posited that there were actually five different things that humans need um, in order to be the best that they can be. But that actually boils down to just two simple things, the need to survive and the need to thrive. To survive, what do we need? Well, in the modern world, we want money, security, physical well-being. But to thrive, to really achieve the best that we can be, we want self-esteem and social acceptance. So this all sounds great, but what on earth has it got to do with customer experience? Well, it means that when any organisation is thinking about customer experience and meeting their customer needs, there are a large number of motivations and different drivers you need to be considering. So, of course, at the bottom, the first things first, you need to meet whatever that basic need is. You need to complete the main task, get the job done. But more than that now, you have to make things easy for your customer. The harder they find an interaction or a task with you, the less positive, the more negative they're going to be about that experience. And if you can, you should really be looking to make the experience enjoyable, make the customer feel positive about that, feel good about that. And again, it's easy to see why this is important for commercial organisations, for organisations where if they don't make their interactions easy and where they don't make them enjoyable, the customer just ups and leaves and goes to somebody in the competition. But surely this hasn't got anything to do with the public health um, healthcare sector, has it? Well, actually, I would beg to disagree. I think actually there are a lot of reasons why this is still valid within the healthcare sector. By making things easy for your customers, so be those your patients, service users, doctors, health professionals, you have the opportunity for efficiencies to actually make things easier across the board and ultimately save time and to save money. More than that, there's a growing body of evidence, of which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that suggests that the less stressed a patient may be by their care, the more positive uh, an experience they have, the potentially better the health, outcome, uh, health outcomes are, the more likely they are potentially to reco recover quickly. And finally, there's a wider consideration around um, the communication of wider health messages. If you can get across messages about why health is an enjoyable thing to do, healthy activities, and they find it enjoyable, people are much more likely to act on it, much more likely to do it, and ultimately, hopefully, reduce the future load on our health services. So there are reasons why still thinking about providing the best customer experience you can do is important within the healthcare sector and the work that, that you guys all do every day. 
So we thought about why we as humans exist. This potentially leads to the question to why do you as organisations exist? The best way to think about this is your average mission or vision statement. This is the mission or vision statement for NHS England. And I'm guessing that most of you here will have your own mission or vision statement that will be similar along the same lines of providing health and high quality care for all. What I want you to do is just over the next couple of minutes, the next few slides, just bear in mind what your mission statement is while I, while I talk you through. This mission statement is precedent. This is the reason why we exist. We exist to um, give meaningful ideas intelligently delivered. When we first started in 1989, what this meant um, was taking huge brand guidelines, big dusty tomes that sat on shelves, and putting them onto CD-ROMs for our clients from our trendy office in Shoreditch. Apparently, that's what some of our staff might have looked like, but I'm far too young to remember that. Um, actually, some of our staff look like that now as well. Um, fast forward 26 years. And the why we exist to deliver meaningful ideas intelligent, de intelligently delivered, that is still the same. But how we deliver those ideas has changed dramatically. So we now deliver a huge suite of digital services to our clients, from strategies and transformation projects to websites, tablet and mobile applications. So we've adapted how we deliver our services to the changing needs of our clients, but also to the changing needs of our customers. And instead of that one office in Shoreditch, um, we've now got 100 experts spread across six locations around the world. Now, our why and how might not have changed. We might have kept delivering or adapting um, to our mission statement. But that's not the case for every organization. Most organizations will start out by meeting the needs of its audiences. But as time goes on, needs evolve. Technology changes. Behaviors change. The shift that we've seen, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years, has been fundamentally huge. And what's happening for a lot of organisations now is that if they're not changing how they deliver, the gap between their mission statement and what they set out to do and how they actually then deliver those services is growing. They're not keeping up and they're at risk of falling behind the curve. So if we return to thinking about your mission statements, I would ask the rhetorical question about how do you feel about your mission statement? The principles of the NHS still hold strong today, the whys of why it was set up. But the how the services are being delivered, you may or may not feel, has adapted or changed. And that's something to think about throughout the rest of the presentation because there is certainly a recognition that healthcare is going to look very different in the future and that digital is going to be a big part of that. And there is an appetite to harness that change. But in an environment where things are moving so quickly, particularly with the internet, how do you even start thinking about how you adapt to those customers' needs and change on a regular basis and, 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 and meet and provide this amazing customer experience? Well, critically, you mustn't only look externally. You mustn't only think about the external customer experience, although that's very important, and I'll talk about that. But if you're going to succeed, you need to look internally as well as externally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or to put it another way, you need to be in control of the customer experience, both at an organizational and an experiential level. Yes, you need to think about customer experience in the context of the modern media landscape, but you also need to think about how you deal with customer experience internally, how you as an organization value customer experience and how you embed that belief in the importance of customer experience, not only at the highest levels, but amongst all of your staff. So based on 26 years of working with clients, ostensibly to help them improve their customer experiences via the medium of digital, Precedent came up with um, our own customer experience model, which we call the care model, particularly fitting um, in the context in which we're talking today. Um, this is divided into four key principles, the first two of which are based around that internal organizational principles. So culture is around how you value customer experience, and analysis is how you take the learnings from your customers and react and, and um, uh, respond to those. 
The second two elements of the model, rational and emotional, are about the experiential, the external elements. So rational is about how you better meet the basic needs of your customers, and emotional is how you go the extra mile, how you make that real difference with the customers. And what I'm going to do for the next 45 minutes or so is take you through each of these four principles, showing you some examples, both in and out of sector, of what people are doing um, uh, to deliver customer experience within each of these principles. So starting with culture, this is the number one thing to look at. If you haven't got this, there's no point doing any of the other things. So how serious you are about customer experience and how you value your customers, because it's only by valuing their preferences and their motivations and needs that you can actually act on them. Best way to illustrate this is with an example. So another mission statement. This is the mission of a well-known commercial organization to provide our customers with the most convenient access to media entertainment. Would anyone like to hazard a guess at who they think this is? Sky? Sky? Netflix? BBC? BBC? All good guesses anymore? Amazon? All good guesses. All guesses I hear a lot. Um, this is actually the mission statement of Blockbuster. <laughs> now, considering in hindsight that they wanted to provide the most convenient access to media entertainment, it is laughable how spectacularly they failed to adapt how they delivered services to their mission statement. The, one of the reasons that they weren't able to do that is because their internal structure wasn't listening to their customers. Their management clung rigidly to the tired old retail model and didn't see what was happening. They weren't listening or looking at what their customers were doing and telling them. And what did that mean? Well, that allowed Netflix to swoop in and totally annihilate Blockbuster. <coughs> now, Netflix are the total antithesis to Blockbuster. They constantly change and adapt. Lots of people forget that Netflix actually started out as a mail-order DVD firm. Um, but what they did is that they saw how behaviours were changing. They saw and understood how their customers were starting to prefer online streaming. They wanted to watch content online. So they went, ah, we'll set up an online streaming model. They did, and as we all know, they were hugely successful. But they didn't stop there. They then said, hmm, our customers like new and exciting content. Let's research what they want, let's research what they like, and we'll produce new content, exclusive content, that they can only access here on Netflix. We'll encourage new customers and keep our existing companies, uh, customers loyal. And that, with the launch of Orange is the New Black, was hugely successful. But they didn't stop there. They recognised that there was actually a problem in the customer experience. Their customers were avidly waiting for the next episode of, of their favourite show, they'd watch it, and then they'd be eminently disappointed that they had to wait a whole other week before they had to watch the next show. Netflix realised that really what most of their customers wanted to do was put on their pyjamas, get a bag of Doritos, sit on the sofa and watch back-to-back -back episodes of 24. Sorry, this is my life. Um, <laughs> And bizarrely, watching back-to-back -back episodes of 24 only takes 22 and a half hours. <laughs> but Netflix even coined a term for it. They called it binge-watching. And they responded to this by saying, do you know what, we're going to release our most popular titles, our new titles, all in one go. We're going to meet that customer need that we've heard and recognised. And the result is that they had over 150 million new subscribers. And this was at a time when they were increasing the costs of monthly subscription and they culled thousands of titles from their database and they hardly lost a single customer. So now that's what you call valuing the customer experience, embedding it internally and responding to customer needs. Now I'm not expecting you all to be Netflix. So what can we as organisations learn from that and apply it in our own context? Well, another closer to home example is one of our clients, um, the British Medical Association. <coughs> We've been working with the British Medical Association for a while now. Um, we started with a sort of digital transformation strategy and a fairly complex redesign and website of their main website build. As part of our research, we discovered that a new need was starting to emerge for their customers, for doctors. Doctors wanted to talk to each other, they wanted to network. But they didn't have time to go out to networking events and they wanted to be able to do it from their desk. 
They couldn't use existing social networks because often the things they wanted to talk about or discuss were sensitive and you don't want to put them on public networks. So actually what they wanted was the ability to have secure online networking that they could access at any time to talk to their peers about issues that were important to them. This wasn't part of what BMA were planning to do as part of their strategy, but they listened to that need and made the decision to actually try and provide and adapt to that need and have actually built um, a secure online social network for doctors as part of their main site, which since launch has proved hugely successful and has helped strengthen their relationship with those doctors and also given them access to sort of information and insight that they may not have had before that. But it doesn't even have to be as big as that when you're thinking about embedding and taking customer experience um, seriously. Um, this is an example I found this week from Derbyshire Community Health Services. And it's just as simple as a slightly more innovative recruitment campaign for their winter staff. Um, they needed to up the numbers to obviously deal with the increasing workload that the, uh, their services saw over the winter period. And the reason that I like this, the reason I think this is an example of an uh, organisation who value customer experience is that they've showcased their staff. They've called it um, Caring Never Grows Old and it was apparently born out of the unwavering passion and dedication that they believe their staff bring to their work and the fantastic experience that they then give to their service users or patients as a result. And they've showcased that as part of the recruitment campaign by focusing on three videos of three real people and real work in the community. So they've really taken both the staff experience and the patient or service user experience incredibly seriously and said, we want people to work with us or work for us who take this as seriously as we do. And in turn, it makes more people want to come and work for the um, Derbyshire Community Health Services. So when you're thinking about culture, there are some uh, key things you can think about doing. The first thing is to make customer experience um, a board-led objective. It needs senior management buy-in. It needs senior managers to believe in the differences that it can make. We often run um, workshops or strategy sessions where we produce business cases and explore possibilities for how customer experience can actually directly impact on an organisation so that they recognise the benefit that putting the weight on customer experience can have. The second thing is taking a bit of time to map the customer experience. This doesn't have to be complicated. It can be done with post-it notes on a wall and a sheet of brown paper. But map out the tasks that your audiences potentially have to do with you, they have to interact with you, and spot where those different pain points are, like the person with the bag of Doritos who wants to watch their next set of episodes. And then think about how you can improve. What can you do to make those pain points a little bit easier? And where is it appropriate to potentially introduce digital to help alleviate that pain point? And often, culture and good customer experience is about the tiny noticeable things. As I said, you don't have to be Netflix. Small things can make a big difference. But whatever you do, don't be stubborn. Listen to what your customers are telling you and react to what they're saying in whichever way you can, big or small. Listening to your customers brings me nicely onto the uh, second principle of the care model, which is analysis. Um, and this is about how you gather feedback and react to it. Starting with another big commercial example, this is um, Coca-Cola. Um, Coca-Cola had an analysis problem. They had a really complex market research model. They thought it was incredibly robust. They went and talked to lots and lots of people with very detailed questionnaires. They did online surveys. They had masses of data. And all it did was confirm or deny what they were already doing. It didn't actually give them any real insight into their customers. And partly as a result of that, Coke had been in a 10-year decline um, in terms of US consumption of Coca-Cola over the last 10 years, and they were trying to find a way to get out of it. And one of the things they realized is that they weren't getting the right information from their customers. They still needed some of that stringent market research and, and, and basic data, but they also needed to have more conversations with their customers, something that was more anecdotal, something that would give them better insights, give them new ideas to help them tap into the minds of their individual customers. And as a result of changing their entire um, marketing research uh, strategy, uh, they actually came up with the 
iconic share of Coke campaign, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with over the last 18 months or so, and the names on the bottles. I never found my name on a bottle. It made me very sad. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just sad for a moment. Um, <laughs> But they, it helped them to identify new ways to evolve. Their how had started to, to go awry again. They weren't really thinking about what it was their customers were looking for from Coke, and this made them realize that actually it wasn't necessarily even about the drink, it was about what they built up around it, the idea of sharing and tapping into the social media elements. And the result was that they saw a 7% sales increase amongst their core ta target audience of young adults. Now, this is fairly massive for a commercial organisation, particularly one that's fighting against all sorts of criticism about fighting obesity and whether and artificial sweeteners um, and who've been in a 10-year decline. So whatever you think about Coke as a brand, the way in which they tackled this, the way in which they turned their fortunes around was simply by changing the way that they, they listened and spoke to their customers. Again, how does this potentially or how can you potentially implement it on a smaller scale? Um, this is another one of our clients. Uh, Perth Arena over in Australia um, and we made a change for them based on one simple um, Google Analytics where we suddenly realized that when people were on tablets or using tablets I should say they spent more money and initially we weren't sure why and then we thought about it and did a little bit of research and it turns out that most people were using their tablets when they were at home after dinner they had a glass of wine they were feeling relaxed they were, maybe they were watching 24, um, and they had, they had um, an inclination to spend more money. Now, we hadn't done anything different with the tablet. tablet. We'd developed a mobile app, and we'd done a website that was responsible and viewable on a tablet, but we hadn't thought about doing anything specific for the tablet. And what this piece of information did is enable us to actually develop a tablet application that was much more focused about upsells and add-ons, other interesting things that you might want to find at Perth Arena, the kind of thing that if you have had a glass of wine, you might just think, oh, I quite wouldn't mind buying that. And that, again, had a fairly fundamental change in terms of their um, sales and made quite a big difference, even though it's on a much smaller scale to what I was talking about with Coca-Cola. So again, different type of research or listening, but you can get the best insights from the smallest things. From a healthcare perspective, um, the simplest way to be seen listening and responding to your customers is obviously on a forum such as um, Patient Opinion, which I'm sure most of you recognise here. Um, this is United Lincolnshire Hospitals NHS Trust, and they are a patient opinion exemplar. And one of the reasons is, as you can see, to almost every single comment or story that goes up on patient opinion. So they have more stories. They've got 48 people from around uh, Lincolnshire Hospital listening and responding. Um, and as a result, 14 stories, you can see in the top right-hand corner there, 14 stories has, have actually led them to make changes um, to the way in which they deliver their services. So they are, again, improving customer experience, improving their relationship with their customers, learning from it and actually using it to make changes without breaking the bank, something that's really simple and relatively easy to do, but can have a big impact. Now, on a larger scale, um, many of you are probably familiar with the emergence of systems such as Patients Know Best and Health Fabric, and I'm not going to pretend to know a lot about these because I'm sure there are people in this room who are significantly more expert than I am. But what I do know is that these are examples of the sort of tools that will help to transform the way in which the healthcare system uses data. So patient knows best, collects all sorts of information on vital signs um, of the patients that are using it, can start alerting healthcare professionals to trends or to any signs that are out of the norm. Health Fabric collects data that can be shared amongst multidisciplinary teams so that they can then better personalise the service to a particular patient. And what I would expect to see in the future is that this is going to happen more and more. These are going to be more commonplace. There may be different systems. There may be one system. I, I don't know exactly how it will manifest. But we know that the amount of data and the type of data you're going to have access to is going to fundamentally change. But now is the time to start thinking about what that might be and how you're going to put yourself in a position to be able to change with it. So when you're considering analysis as part of the care model, be smart. Don't get bogged down with masses and masses of data like Coke did for so many years. Set clear goals, find key nuggets, and act on them. Spend a bit of time benchmarking where you are now and where your peers are and get ideas for how you can then potentially improve that. Listen to your customers. I don't think I've said that yet, have I? Um, 
and harness social media. So social media now is, it provides huge opportunities for every single organisation to um, not only to respond, but to actually gather um, analytics and that more anecdotal data that can make a difference. Um, and consider implementing various different customer experience specific metrics, be that in staff uh, appraisals or general performance measures of the organisation, so that you can actually track how well you're doing with customer experience and potentially the impact and benefits it's having to you as an organisation. So we've got the whole organisation um, internal sorted. Let's move on to thinking about the external or experiential elements of the care model. We'll start with rational, which says there it's about how you meet basic needs. But this doesn't mean delivering basic services. It actually means meeting basic needs in the, the best, potentially the most innovative or easiest way that you possibly can. And again, a good commercial example to illustrate this um, is Heinz tomato ketchup. So this is the iconic glass bottle, still available today, um, that many are familiar with, but at one point this was the only way in which you could buy Heinz tomato ketchup. And as you might expect, there was a customer experience problem with it. Heinz discovered that actually it was quite blooming hard to get tomato ketchup out of the bottle. So, and people kind of subscribed into three categories. You're either the, the patient waiter, the impatient shaker, or the bottle basher. But either way, you either ended up with a tiny splodge or a huge dollop on your plate and you couldn't control what you were, uh, what you were doing. What did Heinz do? They invented the marvellous squeezy bottle and transformed um, the experience of uh, using oh, tomato ketchup. The product hasn't changed, just the way in which they delivered it has changed. The result, no more waiting. Um, and even better for Heinz, people used more ketchup. So they bought more ketchup, so the benefit for the customer and also a huge benefit for Heinz. And digital has the potential to do the same sort of thing for organisations, not just in the commercial sector, but I actually think particularly in the healthcare se sector. There are a plethora of examples of how health services can potentially be delivered better through digital means. One example that, again, you may be familiar with is the um, big white wall. Um, this is uh, an online service providing mental health uh, services. This offers the ability for uh, patients not only to self-manage, but also to have access to cl clinicians, carers and peer support, and to manage this all online should they want to. And since it's been launched, it's had some phenomenal um, results most notably of which they're reporting um, a 58% recovery rate, which is above the um, NHS target. 80% of people are also saying that they are, feel better able to manage their condition, having um, used Big White Wall. And initial indications suggest that it actually also <coughs> saves money, that it will save approximately £370 per user per year by delivering this service online. So it's a better experience for those patients, those service users, and it's also saving, saving money. So from delivering a sort of single or a specific type of service online, it's only a small leap to take it one step worth, further and think about things like putting GP surgeries or GP services online. And again, we are already seeing the emergence of these kind of services happening within the UK. You may, again, you may be familiar, this is WebGP, and there's also another one called Ask GP, but it actually allows people to connect directly with their own GP service through the internet. Um, and why are they doing it? Well, partly because customers expect it. I mean, this is how they interact with every other organisation they deal with. Why shouldn't they be able to do, with, do it with a healthcare organisation? But also because it actually, it has revolutionary potential. That if people can go online, they can self-help, they can have online consultations, they can have online triage, there is potential to reduce the number of missed appointments. There is potential to reduce the number of actually unneeded appointments, all those people who turn up to the doctors but actually didn't really need to be there, which means that you actually leave available appointments for people who actually do need to go in and physically interact with a, with a doctor. And again, the statistics coming out of things like WebGP and Ask a GP seem to be backing up that that's, the, that that's potentially the case. So WebGP, as part of its pilot trials, have reported increased satisfaction 
reduced contact with urgent care units and more willingness for patients or service users to talk about embarrassing problems that they may not have gone to the doctor about beforehand. Similarly, Ask My GP has seen a 40% reduction in face-to-face -face consultations, again meaning that those who do need to see a doctor are actually able to get an appointment with their GP within 24 hours. The final thing I want to talk about, and I think is another potentially key issue, is, is using the internet for public education, so informing them about simple basic information. Um, this is an, ex is an example of something that Thames Valley Police did recently, and some of you may have seen it online. Um, it's a video dealing with the thorny issue of sexual consent by comparing it to offering somebody a cup of tea. If you haven't seen it yet, go and look it up on YouTube, because it's actually really very good. It's quite funny. It deals sensitively with a, with a very serious issue and gets its message across clearly. And by doing that, by making it people feel positive about what they're watching, people are more likely to act on that. They're more likely to um, think it through, and therefore, hopefully, it will do its job of preventing um, uh, uh, more uh, sexual assaults in the future. And in terms of the healthcare sector, uh, more people are latching onto this. So this is an example from uh, Blackpool NHS. This is Another one that is worth looking up on uh, YouTube, because this is quite funny. It's a song called Why A&E, um, sung to the theme tune of YMCA. <laughs> um, but what it does is it's actually a very clear message communicating when service users should use which type of service. So it's obviously aimed at reducing the amount of... Uh, the, the unnecessary burden on people using the wrong service. Now, this is relatively new, and there's no data yet about how successful it may or may not have been, and I'll be keeping a keen eye to find out. But again, it's about thinking of the different ways in which you can use digital, not only as to improve the experience of existing service users or patients you're dealing with, but also potentially as a preventative measure, as something that you can help to reduce um, future workload or future pressure um, within the health service. So if you're thinking about the rational, design with the user in mind is your number one, or the customer in mind. Um, put yourself in your customer's shoes and how they'll use it. Um, I'm not sure if I should say this, but I think that um, Choose and Book suffered from not thinking about the customer at all. Um, hence why I think it then got replaced. Um, prototype test, refine and repeat. All this means is just try stuff. Don't wait years and plan it all and then deliver it, and then actually it's three years out of date. Wherever you can, try things, small things, improve it as you go along. That's the nature of the internet, that things move so fast that if you wait too long, it gets out of date and you fall behind. Um, be consistent in your messages, but don't be constrained by your internal departments and silos. Your customers don't care if you're having an internal kind of discussions about what should or shouldn't be there. They just want to see the message. And where you can innovate, it doesn't have to be on a big scale, it can be on a small scale, but do something different and think about how you can get those more positive messages or you can make things easier with, uh, with regards to delivering your day-to-day -day services. Finally, um, emotional. So this principle is really about exceeding expectations or going the extra, the extra mile for your customers. Um, and the absolute champions of this are... Disney. Now, Disney spent about $1 billion developing the Disney magic band that you can see there. Um, their mission statement, to go back to mission statements, is to be the most magical place on earth. And their vision for the magic band was effectively to take all of the stress out of a holiday and enable it to just be about the magic. So the magic band does everything you'd expect. It allows you to open your hotel door, pay for your um, food, um, get the shuttle access rides and so on, but they've built it around an entire experience that starts right from when you get your personalised magic band box with your names. Imagine the names of my children on that. They would love that. Um, so you start to feel excited about your holiday before you even get there. 
But they, on top of that, it's enabled them to remove all paper-based admin so that the staff can actually concentrate on the experience that they are giving to you. So when you're out and about in the park and you've arranged at 2 p.m. that Cinderella, or more likely Elsa, um, is going to come and meet you and your children, you don't have to be in a specific place at a specific time in a long queue. They can come and find you because they know where you are because of your magic band. When you go to the Be My Guest restaurant, you can go straight to your table, you've pre-ordered your meal online, no need for a table order, it just appears as if by magic. So Disney have kind of thought about every single potential pain point in every single aspect of their customer interactions. And that's one of the reasons why they are the champions. They've done it to their nth degree. And they've used that data to continually improve and develop a seamless and easy experience that is truly designed to delight. Now, a bit like Netflix, I'm not expecting all the organizations in this room to be able to be something like Disney, um, but there are some things that we can take from it. So even just thinking about wearables, <clears throat> we all know that those are going to become more and more commonplace and have um, benefits in terms of the healthcare sector. This is an example from, that Bloomberg publicized about BP, um, who actually used a Fitbit for one of their overweight employees that encouraged him to bring down his health insurance online by recording how much activity he undertook and therefore could bring his premiums down. Um, but it's not hard to see that things like wearable technology will start to feed into those systems I mentioned earlier, like Patients Know Best and Health Fabric, and will add to that massive data that we're going to have to work about how we deal with. But the main reason to consider emotional and to go that extra mile in the same way that Disney did um, is because if you get it right, you can have a massive impact beyond anything that you ever imagined. And a really good example of this, and one of my favorites, um, is the Cancer Research RUV Ugly campaign from a few years ago. Now, there were two reasons this was such a huge success. The first was because of the research and understanding they had of their target audience. So their aim was to reduce some bed use um, amongst 16 to 18 year old females. Um, and they realized that the typical health messages, don't do it, it's bad for you, just wasn't going to work with that age group. But what would work is tapping into their vanity, oh, you're going to look really old before your time. And then getting celebrity endorsements across the whole of the internet. So people from Made in Chelsea or TOWIE, don't know any of their names, <laughs> honest, um, to actually people who this age group identified with to tweet their support for the campaign, to tweet their own photos, their UV photos of what their skin looked like under UV light and how they looked older. But the second reason for its, its success, and the most important one, is that they went the extra mile. They took the campaign out to their audiences. So they took UV scanners out to shopping malls and offered people, shopping malls, where am I from? Um, shopping centers, um, and offered uh, teenagers the opportunity to actually have a photo taken that showed them with the UV light, showed the effect it was already having on their skin. They offered them free consultations where they could take a friend, which might be a mum or, or a sister, so that they widened their use. And they talked to them about the actual physical effect that the sunbeds were potentially having on their skin. And the result afterwards was that of all of the people involved, 46% of them reported saying that they had either stopped using sunbeds or had significantly reduced their use, which for a campaign of this type is a phenomenal success. So much so that the Department of Health have actually decided to, or, or went on to carry on that campaign. But it just goes to show by thinking about that and do, going the extra mile, making a personal connection or an emotional connection to your audiences can actually have a huge impact. Who knows what the potential savings are of this in terms of preventative measures within the health service or of similar things. So if there's an opportunity to do something like this, think about it because the difference makes it worth it. My final example um, is the British Heart Foundation. Again, this is one of Precedence clients um, who we've been working with for about two or three years now. Um, and they came to us at a time when they had, like many large charities, um, a hugely cluttered website, loads of internal silos, basically fighting for space um, that didn't make any sense and didn't provide any real information to their wide and varied set of target audiences. At the time they came to us, they'd also fundamentally changed their strategy. So they'd slimmed it right down and said, the only thing we are going to focus on is getting funding for research um, into heart disease. That's all we want. That's all we're going to be doing. 
And so as part of our research, we decided that actually we needed to get rid of a lot of the clutter and shift our focus purely onto the supporter. Um, and the supporter in various different guises, but all these different people when you do your personas and you say, well, we've got, we've got, some, we've got a donator over here and we've got the survivor over here. We've got... Actually, they can be one and the same person. If you think of them as different people, then you're losing some of that in emotional or personal connection. And as a result of that understanding, we combined it with their three main areas of revenue generation. So those were donating, as you might expect, fundraising events, and thirdly, and slightly bizarrely, um, their furniture and electrical collections. And when we thought about how to actually then build these on the website, we built in the personal emotional elements. So on the donation page, which we stripped back, without, instead of asking all those long questions about, uh, are you happy to be contacted by third parties? Are you happy to, you know, all that stuff. One of the first questions is, why are you donating today? What is it in aid of? Making that personal connection with them. The team pages wasn't just that you set up your fundraising event, you could actually, um, it's quite a complex technical platform underneath it that allows people to add their teams, communicate with teams, converse with other teams, starts to build up a sense of community and empowerment online. So again, going that extra mile to try and do something a little bit different. And again, the results were phenomenal. After launch, within the first month, the British Heart Foundation saw a 277% increase in online donations. That's a convert with a conversion rate of 29%, which was up from 8% at the same time the previous year. There was a 40% increase in furniture and electrical donations, which had the equivalent va value of £1 million to the British Heart Foundation, and a 74% increase in event registrations. So simply by simplifying, but also going that extra mile and doing something that personalised that experience. All of the examples I've shown you within Emotional have had a huge impact as a result of just trying to do that little bit extra. So when you're thinking about the emotional element of the care model, um, think about personality. It's very easy to say, oh, we shouldn't have a personality. But everything needs a personality. People need to identify with it in some way, shape or form. Think about your tone, the way in which people want or expect to be interacted with in the context of your own um, sector. Try to personalise the experience. That doesn't mean investing in really expensive personalisation technology necessarily. In the examples we've seen, it's just about bringing it to them, making it, make them identify with it a little bit more. Exceed expectations on a small or large scale. And again, I can't say it enough. Um, listen, appreciate and continue to learn and evolve with your customers. Hopefully, I've given you some um, food for thought, some good ideas, some things to take away. Um, perhaps you're starting to get a feeling for how much there is for you to do as organisations or how fit you are to survive change. Our customer experience report that accompanies the care model um, that Precedent produced actually has a quiz in it, if you want to take it, um, that allows you to identify where you fit in terms of your, how fit you are to survive change. And there are four potential areas that you can sit in. Um, if you're pretty much not doing anything, then you're endangered. Um, if you know that it's important, but you're still not really doing anything, then you're exposed. If no, okay, you're taking this seriously, you're starting to do a lot more, you're getting your analysis in place, you're doing a few bits and pieces on the rational and emotional, but there's still more to do, then you're up and coming. You're a contender. And then if you're a, a Disney or somebody like that who's really got it, got it all and you're doing a lot on all fronts, um, then you're potentially a champion. I'm not going to ask, but I'll leave with you where you might think that your various organisations sit and what the benefit would be of potentially doing a few more of these. If you do want to do the quiz, you can download our report um, from precedent.com forward slash CX. And some of the examples that I've talked about today, as well as some other insights, um, will be in our up-and-coming health and care research paper um, that we're busily putting together back in the office. That should be available from about, Janu from about January. Although, of course, you can, of course, register to be notified when it comes out by emailing hello at precedent.com. That's pretty much it from me. I finished four minutes early. Wow. Um, in which case, you've got four minutes if anyone would like to ask any questions, but thank you. So. Now I'm scared. <laughs> I 
What was that? The... Whose idea was that? It came out of the research. I don't know exactly whose idea it was, but what Coke said is that as a result of tapping into what their customers were doing, the fact that they were all into sharing, the fact that they all wanted to talk to each other, it made them think differently. So I don't think their customers came up with the idea, but what it did is by spending a lot more time actually just having conversations with them, they kind of went, oh, what we're doing isn't going to appeal to them, let's try this. And then they tested it anecdotally. So they did the, the sort of prototype test refine and saw, s prototyped it and saw if it took off. And then it, it did in a way that, yes, I don't understand why people went for it. Although I am still sad about not finding my name. But, um, yeah. Any more? Sorry, say the last bit again, sorry. What does it mean for the people who are the experts before the internet? The experts in... I think it has a good impact because actually it means that the professionals can concentrate on what it is that they're good at because I think what I would never suggest is that the internet in any sector is ever going to totally replace one-to-one um, -one interaction. It just enables, and that's why one of the things I talk about is working out where digital is best placed to help and actually there are case studies of people who go, oh, we don't need to talk to anybody anymore, we'll just put everything on the internet, and then those fail spectacularly because people actually want to have a, have a human interaction. So part of the challenge is actually working out where digital can actually alleviate burden or stress or problems that those professionals are having so that they can actually concentrate on doing a better job at, at where they are best placed actually delivering that. And I think, again, critically, one of the things we often recommend to our clients is actually having somebody in their organisation who is responsible for customer experience. And I saw a couple of um, job titles today that are around customer care and patient experience, which is great to see. And the importance of that is that they need to work really closely with those professionals, so not make it a kind of them and us situation, but actually all work together to identify different ways, because every channel has its own appropriate use, and it's just about working out what that is, and it, it, it's trial and error again. Did that answer your question? Ish? Okay. So I it's a big challenge for us. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a long journey, I think, but yeah, it comes back to that trying to embed it first, otherwise it it doesn't doesn't happen. I don't think that will happen in five years' time. I think it may happen eventually. I think the only thing I know about the internet is that I don't know. <laughs> it's, I've seen such fundamental changes that it could be anything. However, there is always going to be a need, I believe, for people to go and visit websites or an equivalent or access services online where they believe they are dealing or interacting with a representation of a particular organisation. So, Home, website homepages are all, already almost becoming obsolete because so many people use Google and therefore they access it elsewhere. But having that information all in one place in a way that is engaging and inspiring and that you as an organisation have to put together, however the internet changes, that will still always be needed, but it will become significantly more transactional and significantly <coughs> more um, search-based. I agree with that. But I'll, I will wait, interesting, <coughs> interestingly, in five years. 
We are, myself and my colleagues, Remini and uh, Britt will be around for lunch. Absolutely, yeah. No, thank you.